This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm so glad you came along. Today is a great episode. I have my friend, Dr. David E. Clark on the podcast with me. Dr. Clark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andy. And thanks for the E. That E is critical. <laughs> The, the, look, the, our middle names are important. I'm Andrew S. Miller, and you say, you always include the E, so I thought I should too. Don't let people forget that middle. That's right, S. So Dr. Clark is a psychologist, a speaker, an author. Some of you will recognize his voice from his work. I mean, he, he's been on national shows, particularly focused on the family. That's where I came in contact with Dr. Clark. And so then I found out we work just a mile apart from each other in Tampa, Florida. So I'm just so thankful for the opportunity we get to talk about your new book here. Um, so Dr. Clark, why don't you just fill us in on this new book, Enough is Enough. Why did you decide to write this book? And the, the problem of abuse, especially emotional abuse, is a serious one in the church. The numbers right. are a lot higher than people realize. And as usual, the church, the evangelical church, lags behind in dealing with this problem in an effective way. They ignore it or they mishandle it. I've seen that over good pastors, godly people, they, they just, and, and biblical counselors don't know how to handle it. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to put this book out there. I, I was dealing with client after client that had this issue. And so it's very, my book is very specific, very clear, very direct, like most of my books, like all of them, in terms of what you're dealing with, how to understand abuse, define it, and how to get away from it. Wow. And this is something that you've specialized in. Like you've been a, I mean, a psychologist for more than 35 years, um, and you've dealt with this time and time again. I mean, is, it, is, is this kind of your specialty? I'm sorry to say specialty. Nobody wants to specialize in something that's so bad. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's okay. I do. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, marital crisis is my thing, as you know, Andy. That's what I do. Normal couples, I don't do premarital because it drives me crazy. I want two happy people who are getting married. I, I can't do anything with that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to have a mess. And so, yes, I the the abuse the abused spouse is my thing. Yeah, it's usually a lady, could be a man. How to help them get strong enough, frankly, to leave? Now, what, right. of course, they they don't even know they're being abused most of the time. They right. grew up that way; that they're used to it. They're living in denial. So my job is to break them out of denial and say, no, no, this is an emotional abuser. Right. I don't use that term loosely. If it's not true, it's not true. But if it is true, boom, we have to do something about it. Right. Absolutely. You know, help me, as we get started here, help me just understand what you mean by abuse. What is abuse? Yeah, good question. It is a pattern. It's not just every now and then, or boy, he had a bad day. It is an ongoing pattern of narcissistic, disrespectful, and harmful behavior exhibited by one person in an intimate relationship. Okay. Typically marriage. Yeah. So, and, so in, in that case, then, it's not just physical abuse. Right. That is a particularly heinous example of it, but it's, right. and the church, the church even understands that. Most folks get the physical abuse thing. Well, that's right, outrageous, right. and you got to leave, and yes, you do. But what they miss is the emotional abuse, which frankly is just as bad, if not more damaging than the physical abuse. Yeah. Because it just rips and tears, it depersonalizes, it strips away a person's identity. It does incredible amounts of damage. So it's kind of maybe I, I know that you have dozens of examples of this, but help me know of like a few of these examples of, of emotional abuse. Like when does this happen? Here's what it looks like, Andy. This, for example, verbal criticism is a major factor here. Okay. And this is this is criticism across the board, and it's on a regular basis, and it never stops. If it's the husband who's the abuser, which he usually is, he'll criticize the wife's weight. Okay. Uh, he'll criticize the wife in the bedroom. He'll criticize the wife's uh, housekeeping, mothering. If she has a job, anything she does is cut down, never good enough, and it never quite ends. That's how he maintains control over her. And for the abuser, who's also a narcissist, usually he controls everything to them. He wants mm. you to be one down and he wants you to keep trying to please him. But the game is it's never going to work. Mm. And of course, also, there's there's an absolute neglect of her needs. The Bible is clear. The husband is to meet the wife's needs. We see that yeah. in Ephesians 525. Lover as Christ loved the church. That covers everything. Well, he, he could care less. It's all about his needs. Her needs mean nothing. Mm. There'll be this silent treatment, kind of a classic technique of, of the narcissist. Either he, it's always a monologue. He will rant and rave and criticize. And then you, you, you have to agree with them or it'll just get worse. And mm -hmm. if you do disagree, he will shy head these guys shut down for days and weeks and months of just cutting her off. No communication. Yeah. And for a woman, that's just awful. Yeah. 
And these guys can, and of course they, they have no conscience. So they always believe they're right. He has no, he's never felt bad about anything he's done in his life. Wow. Could take the form. Of course, he controls the finances, controls your friends, controls what church you go to, controls uh, yeah, the clothes you wear. Control is always a major factor in abuse. Hmm. He will slander you to other people, even to your own children. Most of these guys will, over a course of decades, turn your own children against you. Wow. Well, mom's a little unstable. Your mom's crazy. Uh, he, he can take an incident where maybe you lost control and melted down, but that's about mom because he wants to win them too. I mean, it's just yeah. insidious. Yeah. There could be an addiction. There usually is. Could be a sex addiction. Could be an alcoholic. Could be a drug addict. So those these are serious categories. This is mm -hmm. not a guy that struggles with something, has gotten better, and is walking with the Lord. Oh no, he's a dirt ball. I mean, for lack of a better word. Uh, hey, well, and. I uh, yeah, I appreciate you saying because like that I had you on the podcast last time um, with your book that you self-published called My Spouse Wants Out. And when we had that conversation, the day that I published it, I had a couple of people contact me and say, this is me. Wow. And and I think what was helpful and some people won't like this approach. I know you've probably heard this criticism like you just said, this is a dirt ball. And you like ask people to kind of get in a realistic place to realize what has happened. I mean, the, the challenge, I mean, this is the challenge is that people are listening to you right now and they heard right in that moment, that's me. Wait, before we go, I may have some other questions I want to ask, but like, before we go on, what, what do you say to those people? If, if they're sensing that they're kind of like feeling, oh, I can't do this. This would be too hard. But I mean, what do you say to somebody who's living with a dirt ball? Well, I say, look, this is a process. You're not, you're not going to get strong enough today to leave him. You're not. This may take weeks, months, even a year or two, but you, we have to start the journey. Because by the time I see them, Andy, and, and you're, you've been a pastor, you know what that's like. They are just so devastated. They can't, they can't even think about leaving. Right. However, right. we serve the God of the universe who has infinite power. He can do anything. And so if that person doesn't know Jesus, I will, I will in, uh, in, introduce them to Jesus. I'm but most of the time they are Christians. And so we start a process. First, we define it very carefully. They want to make sure, well, I need to make sure that what you're saying is true. I say, I walk them through their story. After 35 years, it doesn't take long. All the, I say, look, he's doing this. He's doing that. He, they're just telling their story, but it's like they're talking for somebody else. They, they, you know, they think it's okay. They're in denial. Wow. So I will say after 45 minutes on the phone with them or in person, you are married to an emotional abuser. You absolutely are. Look at, look at all these. And so that the light, and they'll, they'll resist me on that because they're smart enough to know, well, if this is true, then I, I'm going to have to do something about this. Right. It, it's destroying me. It's destroying my children. And I'll even tell them, look, we're going to give this abuser a chance. It's destroying him too. We're going to give right. him a chance to change. Hey, fair. Uh, so it just, I have to break, it takes a couple of sessions to break through the denial barrier. Yeah. I'm like yeah. the hammer. I'm not, I'm not a warm, fuzzy guy. I'm just <laughs> right to the point. I'll say, look, I'm just telling you. You can do what you want. You can choose to stay with that guy until everything's destroyed. God will allow that, but he doesn't want you to do that. Wow. So I got to get him out of the denial boat onto cold, hard reality, land mass, and realize, okay, here's what I'm dealing with. Wow. Then we got to get him strong enough because many of these ladies, as you know, Andy, have, they grew up in a home where there was an abuser, mom or dad, one wow. parent abusive, one parent passive, they've seen it. And so they're just, this is just the way it is, why they chose this guy in the first place. So they have to get, they have to work through some things to get strong enough to go, you know what? I have a voice. I'm not putting up with this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just hope people are listening. Like this might just be the place where people have come to. And I hope that you'll take Dr. Clark's encouragement. And I mean, what's the likelihood I, mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to look for odds necessarily, but of things being restored. I mean, if, if it's going to be restored, it's going to have to take this tough approach where you acknowledge what it is. Um, but is there any hope of a restoration when abuse has happened? Like no, there's some. Abuse? Yeah. And I never know, you know, what, which abuser is going to change and which one won't. But the fact is, if it's a bona fide abuser, the way I'm describing it, yeah, it's not good. Four to six percent. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. Now, fair so, enough. So how, and, and, and biblically, we give we give the sinner a chance. Right. The, the Bible's clear. We confront. We Matthew 18 is very clear in confronting and going. And, and in my case, you're leaving him. When, and I've told ladies all the time. I, I told three this last week. Uh, when you, we, you're leaving your abuser, when you leave him, that's when you find out if he loves you, if he loves the Lord, if he loves your kids, or he doesn't. When wow. a man loses his woman, he, the right guy will move heaven and earth to get her back. He'll do whatever wow. it takes. 
walk wow. with the Lord, get his narcissism fixed, and there are programs for him. But if it's the wrong guy, he never will. That'll be your confirmation. Interesting. Wow. It, this narcissism, and you've brought it up several times. And this is when somebody is just focused, their whole life is on them. Everything is, is, is like thinking about, they're not asking questions in conversations or they're controlling things to benefit themselves. I mean, when they do this type of thing, do you think it, it, like, it comes because they've gotten something that they want in the past? Is it like it's worked for them? Is that why? I mean, I'm, this is a hard question. It's not answerable, but why are people narcissistic? <laughs> Boy, it is a good question. I think, yeah, most of these narcissists, and I've dealt with them enough, I see them one time and then I refer them to somebody else because I have no patience. I work with the victim, but yeah, they grew up in a home where often there, there was abuse and even they were abused. And so to fight that, to overcome that, it becomes all about me. It's me against the world. So that core of narcissism. The other possibility is, oh, they were on a pedestal from day one. Mm -hmm. The only boy in the family or the only girl, they were just, they were just, you know, they're loved on and, and it was just overkill, you know, the trophy mentality. And so I, I get everything I want. So they're used to it. And this works well in American society. It absolutely does. Wow. Politically, uh, economically, a career, uh, you know, you, you can really get successful by being a narcissist. We've seen that across the board in politics. Most politicians are, frankly, are narcissists. Probably, yeah. So, yeah, it's developed that way. Now, and our culture is just feeding narcissism. The last 10, 15 years, especially social media, I believe, plays a role in this. Okay. It's all about me, what I'm doing, the trip I'm taking. Look what I'm having for lunch. People take pictures of their food. I, I don't <laughs> care. It's, it's just one of the, any Christian folks, well, you know what? It's all about us. And, of course, Satan yeah. pushes the agenda, too. Are you on social media? I am only because I have to be. <laughs> I, I and it's a business thing for me. It's a it's a ministry thing. Uh, Phil Dugas, my son-in-law, one of my son-in-laws, Dugas Creative. He does all my digital stuff. So he's he does the social media. I don't, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, so one of the things that this is all resting on, and this is why I've always appreciated about you, is like you have the the training as a psychologist, the therapist, but also you have a biblical training as well. And you bring that into your dis discussions always. And um, like, for instance, even in your books, like every time in your books, and I just haven't read them all, but I've read a couple. It seems like you find a place to present the gospel. It may not always be at the same place. So this rests on the fact that you have a theology of marriage and you under like, and, and with that theology there, some people would disagree that there is a, um, a, a mechanism for divorce, even in scripture. Can you talk to me about that? Is there, is there really a justification for a divorce in scripture? Well, there is. Absolutely. There are exceptions. Now, God is clear. He doesn't want that to happen. It doesn't please him. He hates divorce. We see in Malachi too. He's right. right. However, because he knows the hardness of hearts, he knows abuse of men. And that was true in the Old Testament as well as the New. There are exceptions. Now, I'm very careful with that. Even if I have a woman sitting in front of me or a man, who has clear biblical reason. And I think there's three biblical reasons for divorce taught in scripture. And I've studied it very carefully, even two seminaries, I'm careful about this. Even if I have that, I never recommend divorce, not my business. I'll say, okay. look, God has, you have biblical reason. I'm not recommending it. As far as I go is separation, like in this book, the enough is enough book, Andy, but I'll say, God will, God will guide you. God will direct your path. Hmm. We've got ongoing unrepentant adultery. That's number one. It's a hideous okay. offense against a marriage. I'm not going to stop. Okay, that's a biblical reason. It's so destructive. We've got the abandonment by the unbelieving spouse. That's clear in 1 Corinthians 7. What I also believe now, and this is with careful study and thought, Dr. Wayne Grudem, who's one of my heroes uh, theologically, yeah. now believes that there is a third biblical reason for divorce, and that is ongoing, unrepentant, never going to stop emotional abuse, also found in 1 Corinthians 7.15. The phrase in such circumstances, he believes, applies not just to the abandonment issue, which is horrible and destructive, but to other issues. And we look at the Old Testament and knew there's a whole, whole theology here that can be developed. And I believe it's true. Hmm. But again, I'm not going to I'm not going to play God. There are therapists that do that and even pastors. But I, I, yeah, I think you should get divorced. That's never going to come out of my mouth. That's that's God's decision. Because right. marriage is sacred. You're right. going to have to. And most of these dear ladies, you know, Andy, you've seen them work with them they have this isn't the in the first month of the abuse they're thinking about leaving or divorcing it's 20 years it's 25 wow. years it's 30 wow. years i've seen these sweethearts been married 50 years to a dirt ball and there's nothing left of them they don't want a divorce wow so i just go so far as leaving 
we let's see what he does. Get ready, get strong enough, get the finances, get the kids ready, leave, and let's see what he does. Yeah, that's helpful. Now let's just imagine right now that somebody is watching watching this, listening to this, and they think that this is me. Could you just like kind of say, give an example of what will happen if they stay with this abuser? Yeah, here's what's going to happen. And I've told hundreds, if not thousands of ladies this. Number one, you will be physically destroyed. Hmm. The stress of living with an abuser breaks down the body. And when they're more sensitive, their their systems, and so it will break you down. The ladies that end up leaving, in every case I've had, they improve physically every single time. Hmm. So physical destruction happens. You are emotionally destroyed. You're depersonalized. You have no identity. Your self-esteem and and, and, uh, confidence is shredded. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be anxious. All kinds of emotional damage is done. Can't avoid it. Going to happen. Spiritual damage as well, which is the most serious thing of all. Your relationship with God will be will be stressed. You will not be, even on the level of you will not be an effective servant of his as much as you could be because of all you're going through. Plus, there's questions about God and why would you allow this to happen? All that stuff happens. And for ladies, especially the fourth damage is the most important. I say, look what you're you're your kids will also be destroyed. They will never be the same if you stay. Uh, The boys end up learning how to be abusers because dad's modeling that. They're not stopping it. Boom, they're going to be abusers and they'll start abusing you too. The girl, who are they going to look for to date and marry? Mm. Boom, an abuser. And these dirt balls are everywhere. So that's going to happen. That will be on you. You don't know mom wants that. But also, as I mentioned before, the abuser turned, he poisons the kids. He turns them against you. They will lose respect for you. They'll lose love for you because the kids, this is dad. They, they're not living the, the marital nightmare. And there's a different boundary here. So they think, well, dad and dad's convincing them it's going to end up being your fault. And so what happens is they side with the abuser and you're left alone. Wow. Oh my goodness. So that, that's what happens. There are no exceptions. That That's exactly, I've seen it so many times. I've seen ladies who I'll see them in a marriage, they may be 10, 12 years in. And I'll say, look, you better get out. Here's a book. Let, here's a, and they decide not to. I see them 10 years later. Dr. Clark, I should have listened. My kids won't talk to me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm still married to this guy and, and I'm, I'm, I'm broken down. I have kidney disease. I have heart problems. I say, well, get out now. Mm-hmm. So don't wait. Don't wait. Yeah. So what I'm thinking about some of my audience, like I, so I teach at Wesley Biblical Seminary. We have 500 students here who are training to be trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we have people who are in the audience who are serving as pastors right now. Um, what are, what are some things they could do or what, what, how about this? What are the mistakes we make as pastors? <laughs> probably, cause we probably mess this up sometimes that that's one side. And then two kind of what's a positive side of what we can do. Oh, pastors can have a tremendous impact. Study after study shows, and this is the way it should be. When people in in a church setting are really struggling, who do they call first? They call their pastor. He's the shepherd, the spiritual guy, and they should. Everybody I see in therapy, I have them sign a release. If they're in a church, you're in a church, you know your pastor. I I, I have a release signed for the pastor so I can contact him. He's on the team. He's critically important. So they can really make it. If you come alongside a woman, the women I know who who have been supported by a pastor, who's confronted the husband, who's helped her leave the home. Oh, my goodness. It means the world to them. Right. Those pastors that don't, of course, it it can it can turn them against the church, which is not good. I say, look, you might have to find a new church. But pastors, well-meaning people that don't do the work that I do, they often make mistakes. They'll tell the lady after she's told her story of abuse. They'll say, well, you you know, the, the Bible's clear. You have to submit. You have to submit to your husband. Mm -hmm. are you kidding me you don't submit to abuse and sin they'll say well it's not abuse they'll redefine it because they don't want to really face it they don't have experience well he oh he loses his temper so it's minimalized it's justified and so she's left thinking well gosh it's not abuse all right or or she'll be told which is often the case in churches like a boys club sometimes and many times and well sweetheart there is abuse going on here but it's your fault oh my if you wouldn't trigger him, if you would love him more than he changed, that's ridiculous and totally unbiblical. But and they're well-meaning. Right. I think the pastor thinks, I've got this couple in front of me, and he doesn't understand abuse anyway, but he thinks this guy, yeah, this guy's not going to change. So I, the one I have to work with is the lady. But the, the problem is, rather than saying, like I would say, get away from him, t- take steps, get strong, get a voice, leave him. They think, no, it's a marital thing. So I'm going to help her. If she'll make changes, maybe he'll change. Right. No, right. he won't. It's been five years, 10 years, 20 years. That feeds the, the whole process. You're just enabling it. Guys like wow. this don't change. 
Right. This is this is what it takes like to produce change. I mean, it takes this re- dealing with reality, with putting it in a position where we're able to say this is the consequence of my actions and therefore I want to change. Okay, I want to jump in here, make sure people know we're talking about your book, Enough is Enough, and it's published by Moody Publishers. And I'm so thankful for Moody. They reached out to me and they offered, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Clark, they off, they, they're giving me five books. They must think I really need it. No, they're, they're giving me five <laughs> books to give to our audience today. So if you, you're listening to this and, and maybe you're in this situation and like you need this book for your own relationship, but I'm guessing that most of my audience probably needs this because you need this as a resource. So here's what you can do to win a copy of this book. You can go to social media and share a link. Don't be narcissistic narcissistic when you do this, by the way, okay, at social media. Um, we don't want to see your lunch. Just, <laughs> just, just Dr. Clark's book. You share a link to this podcast. You just write a word about it. Make sure make sure I see it. I mean, generally I do when people share from my author page. Um, you can leave a comment on YouTube or you subscribe to my email list. So you go to andymillerthird.com. That's andymillerii.com. And there you can sign up for my email list. So anytime like when this is published to so two weeks after that, if you sign up for my email list, you'll be entered into the contest to win. So you could win Dr. Clark's book. Enough is enough. Anything you want to say about the book, uh, Dr. Clark, before we get, I want, I have a few more questions for you. Well, only that, as we discussed earlier, it's a miracle that, that, uh, that Moody has picked up this book. I have great respect as you do for Moody. They're conservative, right, absolutely. they're solid. And this came out of like nowhere, but it's a, it's a God thing, like everything is. And it's a way to really, I think, get the word out. And I would also say this, Moody publishers need to, pu- needs to publish several books by Andy S. Miller, the third. Oh, just there you out. go. And I believe that's going to happen. <laughs> okay. Well, when, when I finish my dissertation, I'll be in touch with you. And, uh, you know, you can give me a, a, a nice hey, uh, entree into. Please do. The, I will do whatever I can. But, oh, the district, I remember the dissertation day. That's got to come first. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have, I mean, I have my, my past two books and then I, and I have some other projects and they're there and I'm putting off to the side. I'm like, oh, stay focused, stay focused. Yeah. I got to so, get through. Yeah. But that, I pre- appreciate you saying that. And, and look, one of the things, like those of you guys are interested, Dr. Clark, you know, has a national names on national programs. Uh, if you see on Focus and Fame, books published by all kinds of evangelical uh, publishers. But at the same time, like for a while, you're just public self-publishing because you could control it better. You're making more money from it. But you've decided to go with Moody in part here because it's getting the word out. And, and they're really good at that. Oh, right? they are. Their editing was, was masterful. The people I've worked with, just world-class. He, and they, they have a platform that's very impressive and it's trusted. Right. So this is a chance where I mean, people should trust David Clark, E. Clark, but uh, they're, <laughs> if they're not sure, <laughs> what a shock, then they, with Moody, Moody would not publish this book, not a word of it, unless they were fully behind it. Right. So I'm thinking, right. wow, this is confirmation. And unlike a lot of books on abuse, I don't waste time talking about why the abuser is the way he is. I mean, get, who cares? That, that's mm. another rabbit hole. Understand it only so you can change and heal. I'm worried about the victim. Heal, get a voice, protect your kids and get out. Right. So it's a very different, specific focus. Yes. However, biblically, we, once you're out, you do give the man a chance to change. You do. Right. And that will confirm, frankly, it will confirm one way or the other what we're dealing with. Now, in your book, you do talk about four things that people should do before they leave. You know, before. So uh, I, lo- I love how practical it is. Um, and you crack me up, but your writing just cracks me up sometimes. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> but go, 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 what, what are those four steps you want people to take before, before okay. they leave? Number one, you have to get a team around you, a team of warriors. This okay. is not something you do alone. So if in fact you have a supportive pastor, that's a gold mine. You sign him up. If you don't, and, and if, a, if your pastor simply, you go to him and you talk and he doesn't get it, okay, you're not going to keep going to him. He may still be your pastor and you might not leave the church yet because you got kids and you're not ready. Because this whole plan is a secret plan, as you know, Andy, the abuser doesn't know. Okay. So you'll find another pastor, hopefully, at another church even that may support you. Uh, you need one accountability partner of the same sex, close friend, especially if you, who's on the team, who can keep a secret, who is supportive of you. You tell the secret of the abuse to family and very close friends. Most ladies don't say a word outside the home because they don't. It's embarrassing. I'm trying to protect my husband. I think it's my job. No, it's not. Not with an abuser. So these are people you can trust. They're not going to confront your husband. That's not going to be the point. Not now. That comes later after you've left. But you've got that. You also, if you can find a great Christian therapist who gets it like 
well, I'm not saying great, but like me, a therapist who gets it, who understands yeah. male or female, that can be very helpful, obviously, to guide you through the process. And you'll tell the abuser, look, I'm getting therapy for myself because I'm messed up. He'll buy that because he thinks it's your fault anyway. Uh, no worries there. Um, and then, of course, you I, I think a solid family law attorney is very important. You want to do this legally and protect yourself financially. So you have that person on the team as well. And one of the things that I, I ran into, even last time I had you on the podcast, I had people reach out to me who, um, like, my spouse wants out. That was the name of the book. They're like, look, I, I'm in this situation. And they were hesitant about pulling the trigger to even pay to have a conversation with a, with a therapist or pay to see a lawyer. Um, I mean, it seems like it just might seem like so much money, um, and it and it is, you know, to certain people, particularly people who, you know, if they're not the ones who control the funds in their family, can you speak to that issue a little? How, how do you handle that if you can't, if you can't afford it? Boy, this is what the body of Christ is for. A couple ideas here. Part of my strategy, Andy, is before you leave, of course, is developing your financial life. Because okay. yeah, chances are you don't have any money. You're a stay-at-home mom or whatever money you do make, you might make more than your abuser. He takes it, he controls it. So there's some moves you can make there because you're his wife that you can kind of get more access and get more money. I recommend starting a secret account that's got just your name on it and, and you start, that's your, that's your war chest. You start putting money in there. Education, training, this might take months, but you're getting yourself together financially. Okay. And, and that's what family and friends are for. We have some dear friends we have helped before and they've helped us. Okay. Because at certain points in life, you don't have any money. We had four kids and they were all in college. Talk about no money. <laughs> I was making a lot of money, but I, I couldn't show it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so some friends helped us. So yeah, you could go to a friend and even one time, like for, like me, a one a one time session can make a difference. It is a lot of money, but to give you a plan of action and get you going in the right direction. And if you can find a therapist who can help you, then that's, yeah, your dad will pay. If any one of my precious daughters came to me and, and needed money, I would give them the shirt off my back. Of course I would. So family, friends, uh, and in terms of the legal situation, in most communities, the government will have an option. County government especially will have, maybe state, local, they, they will have some services for the abused wife that you can avail yourself of. These right. might even be liberal people. Who cares if they're helping you? If you say, I'm, I'm living with an abuser, they can provide some legal Legal aid society, there's people that can help you in that way. So yeah, you it may take a while to get the money to do it, but just get you gotta start somewhere. Yeah, sure. That's really helpful. You know, what do you do now? Like, so let's say they've taken those steps, they have their team, they have their money, they have their lawyer in place. Now, now they're out. They're they're out from underneath the abuser. What do they do then? At that point. And, you, and a lot goes into leaving, of course, but the first month of leaving, you have very little contact with the abuser. In fact, it's only through intermediaries. You're going to have one solid support person. Could be your dad, could be, could be a close friend, somebody could be a pastor who is communicating. Because as you leave legally, if you have kids that are still minors, you will, he, he has the right to see them. You don't hold the kids back from him. But all okay. that's orchestrated outside of your direct contact because you're you're done. So a month of just kind of getting settled in, getting your place is a huge adjustment, make sure the kids are okay. Through somebody else, you you work out the details of when you can see the kids and it's outside of your presence. He has okay. lost you. Wow. And frankly, in that month, that first month of not much, kind, you're going to, other folks are dealing with him for you. You're going to find out what he's like. Is he furious? Is he blaming you? Is he truly broken? Is he saying he's willing to do anything? We'll find out. Okay. So after the month, that's when we start doing biblically Matthew 18, 15 through 17. You have already You've already, of course, you've left now, but now we start that process. By, and there's a list in the book. Here's a list of things. If you want me back, because I'm done with you because of the okay. abuse. I, if you want me back, here, here are seven or eight things you're going to need to do over the next five, six, seven months if you even want a chance to have me back. No, I say, ladies, don't, don't give any guarantees. No guarantees. M might not. I might uh, leave you and never, never come back. But if you want me back, do these things. Okay. And then. And then that's, that's, that's the, really the first of Matthew 18. If he doesn't respond to that well, ignores you and says, well, these, I can't believe you're doing this to me. I'm not doing any of these. It's all your fault. Yeah, fine. Okay, then we go to the one or two witnesses. Your key accountability partner could be the pastor too. You send, you send them to him and they, they confront him on his sin. You need to do the list. He rejects them. You take it to the church. Pastor may already be involved, but now the church they can they can they can uh, do church discipline. They can they can uh, make it make the leaders aware of what's happening, and they can come against him. We're actually trying to save the abuser's own life. He doesn't get it. Now, if he resists that, then 
that's when the, the last stage, of course, in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, verse 17 is you, you back off. You've mm -hmm. already separated. You just stay separate mm -hmm. and yeah. really have not much to do with it. And then I say, God, God will guide you. Well, should I get, I've been asked this question many times. Should I divorce him? I say, I can't answer that question. Only God can answer that. You're out, you're living your life and you're kind of an observation. Well, there's usually a period of time that God will have you wait. Giving, again, giving that abuser one more chance and then, okay, then you, you know, he'll guide you if you're, if you can file. Yeah. You know, biblical reason, I'm just not going to recommend it. God has to recommend it. Right, right. There has to be that confirmation. You know, I, um, I was talking, we became friends in Tampa and, um, while we were there, Abby and I actually came and saw you for three sessions. And then you said, get out of my office. I only deal with messed up people. And, uh, <laughs> but, but part of it was working through even what does it mean for, for me to leave Salvation Army officership? That was kind of what I, I'm, I know I'm kind of sharing personally here, but I, I seek it. And you're like, well, sounds like there's a reason to leave. Sounds like a reason to stay, but you're going to have to hear from God on this. Yeah. And we're both going to have to hear. And that was really, that was a, a helpful Please. And then I got to a place where God was speaking and then I had to decide, okay, am I going to listen? And, right. and that was, that was the, maybe the harder point was like, I can I could develop a rationale to ignore God's voice here, but I got to a place where I realized that that would be sin. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. I mean, it'd be disobedience. Even if you get to a place where you, you feel, and then you pray and you sense, you take these steps that Dr. Clark gives you. You um, get to a place where you say, you know what, Lord, this is what you're asking me to do. I wish this wouldn't have been the case, but given my cir circumstances, you're asking me to take this. It, does that sound right? Am I off of that, Dr. Clark? No, oh, you're exactly right, Andy. That's exactly how God works. He's so faithful to us. He loves us. As a father, only a father can love his children, the Bible says. So yeah, if you, if you truly bring a matter before him, he will answer it. And he yeah. will open the door. And when God opens that door of release, it's clear. Okay, then you have to act on it. Uh, yeah, he will not condemn you to hell. He will not drop you if you choose not to leave an abuser. He won't do that. But what he wants you to do, I'm convinced biblically, is to leave. You have every right to leave. And he wants you to leave. God won't force you. But if he opens that door, yeah, take it. Okay. Take it. Yeah. This, this is also interesting. Now, I'd love to, I, you know, this book is going to be really helpful to people. And it's the type of help that we need, like when you really get in trouble. Now, you also have some other great things to say. Like, now, could you just speak to that? Maybe there's a, a couple who've listened to this podcast, and they're, they're hearing it, and um, things are going well, but they just need a tune up in their marriage. Like, they're not in a place where they have a, an abusive situation. What are some of those, uh, your top few tips for improving your marriage in general? Well, it's a great question. Yeah, I, I, and, and if you're not, God, praise God that you're not in this situation. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But you might, again, you might know someone who is, so it's still a resource. But, but I've, got, I've got a book for everything, as you know, Andy. <laughs> Andy S. Miller III. Uh, I, I, Men are clams, women are crowbars. It would be a great book for communication, improving that. Honey, we need to talk. Okay, Another say that again. That you, now, you, you, you're very familiar with that. Uh, m men are uh, clams. Women are clams. Men are need crowbars. Say that again. What, what's that title? The title is Men Are Clams okay. and Women Are Crowbars. Yeah, I talk fast. <laughs> this is the guy that, good guy, but he won't open up, has trouble talking. The lady's talking and trying to get him to, there's a whole strategy in that book, a number of them, to really help a guy open up. And Now, the lady could be the clam, too. It could go the other way. But opening up. There's a book I wrote called A Marriage After God's Own Heart. In fact, it's the, it's the best-selling of all my books. It was written years ago, 2000, I think maybe even after 2000, 2003 or four, where putting God at the center of your marriage. And I, you may not know this, Andy, I've written a, a, a recent devotional, um, How to Become Soulmates. Oh, interesting. And it's, it's, it's very personal. And it's, it's, I think it's a very simple approach to, I mean, there's 52 you know, uh, different uh, devotionals, just kind of going through, talking, sharing, that people are really enjoying that. It's really bonding them in a spiritual way. Right. So we've got a book for you. You, if you just where, where can they the, get that? Where can they find this? DavidEClark.com. Is that what it is? Yes, it is David E. Of course, it's the E. That goes without right. saying. But David E. Clark PhD. Oh. Com. Just simple. David E. Clark PhD. Com. Everything's there. Gotcha. That's great. Now I want to get your your. Uh, your thoughts on something that's come through the news today. Now we're recording this in December. I think this is going to come out in January um, when your book comes out. But 
there was a, a case, I don't know, a case or a ruling or something I heard on the news this morning about Canada making a move to have um, a ban against confer- conversion therapy as it relates to human sexuality. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I, I, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm curious, like as a therapist, I know this might not be the area you work in, but how does that strike you when you see uh, laws like this or, or people talking about this type of issue? I mean, it, it seems like it's moving against the general kind of Christian view that people can change in some degree. I'm not, I'm not saying that orientations change or anything like that, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts there. Boy, I, you know, it makes me angry. Number one, it's really okay. despicable. That level of state control. I don't like, I don't care what the area is, but this is a personal choice. Now you're telling me if I, if I'm a man and I have homosexual tendencies or I'm in the gay lifestyle and I have decided with God's guidance to get out of it and I need help to do that. I can't do that wow. because the therapist, now, as a therapist, they're telling me, I can't do that kind of work. Unbelievable. It's way out of line. And I've had cases, I, I refer to a guy down in Bradenton that does this work. He's a godly man, Dr. Dilworth, Brayton in Florida. He's what he does. And, and he has made a tremendous difference in this area of sexuality, especially for men. Wow. We're not, we're not here in the States, but they're going to already minors in many States. You cannot do conversion therapy. Yeah. Because they're smart enough to know we don't want, they, we can control minors, I think, and their parents. Um, and and if, you, if you can catch them in the teen years, you have a much better chance for the conversion. Right. Well, if they, if they get to 18, okay, it's harder, still doable. But I think we're going to get that the same place here. When I first came in, was was a psychologist in my training, Andy, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is our, our, our manual of uh, diagnoses, homosexuality was in that book as yeah. a mental disorder, wow. which frankly, it is, like okay. all the rest. No judging, it's just the way it is. Well, they took it out. They took it out, and it's never going back in. I mean, for mm. heaven's sake. Now, I, you know... Uh, you know, we were to reach out to the, to the gay people, love on them, never judge them, try to lead them to Jesus. But if they want to change, they should be allowed to change. Right. People should be able to have, be able to enter into a relationship with a counselor to produce a behavior they want. Like you're talking to people whose marriage, like in an abusive situation, they should be able to enter into that relationship with you as a counselor to make a decision. I want to change. I want to change the situation. They shouldn't get into your office is what I, I feel well, like. Like I think that that's what's happening here. Canada was a free country, yeah, not anymore. And we're seeing similar things in the States with the massive level of control. My goodness, let people decide. Be like telling me I can't work with the abusive wife and help her leave an abuser. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? We're, we're going to reach a point where, where I'm going to do that. Whatever the state says, I'm going to do that anyway. There's a higher law and we're going to have to, we're going to get to the point. We're going to have to follow that. No matter what the state says, I'm not complying I'm, God is teaching me, I'm going to have to do this. Wow. I think that day is coming. Wow. There, and you know, the idea of therapies, there are a lot of different therapeutic approaches that you can take, like you can take with abuser. And I imagine like your, your friends in the field who work in this area of human sexuality, they might have like a different answer that they might use, like a, a different type of therapy. Um, and if, if they use a particular approach, that's one thing. It's just funny to me, where does a government get into or or the church and and there are even you know i'm I'm a member of the salvation army there are even salvation armies that have not in the united states but in other other parts of the world have said we are against conversion therapy i'm like that's crazy for the salvation army to say that we're like the salvation army but nevertheless like it's crazy see that that's, that's letting society dictate and override scripture god is clear now he's clear on all sin homosexuality being one of the sins it is a sin and he doesn't want you to be in that lifestyle but you can't say that anymore in this world you know people come after you well right. i'm sorry it's just as much a sin as as heterosexual sin Amen. As yeah. sexism, of adultery it, okay it's the same thing right but, but there the society has carved out an exception there. right These are there any other therapies out. you're not allowed to use like does the government step into any of your therapeutic approaches no, I don't listen to the government anyway, frankly, but, <laughs> but they, they really haven't. No, I've had no problem there. I'm like under the radar. I'm a licensed yeah. psychologist in Florida yeah. and, and the FPA, the Florida Psychological Association, that does a good job. I don't believe uh, a number of their liberal views. I just don't. Um, but, you know, I, I, they haven't bothered me. I do what I want to do. You ask my Sandy, my blonde. I, I do what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> if, it's, if it's biblical, I, hey, I'm going to do it. Yeah. 
Oh, you just brought up Sandy, the blonde to me. Now I, we are your fans. I was your fan before I, I met you. And so I had heard you on other, other radio shows and you would talk about your wife, call her the blonde. You wanted to marry a blonde from California. And so then I came to see you and then I, I met, I met the person at the desk. She had blonde yes. hair. I didn't have the thought. And you, and then you said, that's my wife. I'm like the blonde. <laughs> that's right that's what people do and she is a wonderful person oh my goodness as is your dear abby wonderful women of god and they put up with us yeah so so what's next for you what are you working on next uh what type of project do you have down coming on the pike are you going to keep keep producing books i am i'm, I'm still doing the self-publishing thing I got a couple of things in the hopper Andy. glad you asked I'm doing a how to counsel video series. We've just, we've just filmed it. And now Phil Dugas is going to kind of be putting it together. This is for pastors, mostly for non-professional counselors. Okay. Just some basic principle after 35 years, rolling that out in the new year, probably after, probably after February. And I'm working right now on a pre-step book to the enough is enough book. Okay. Okay. One of these ladies, they'll say, boy, I, I get it. It's biblical. I need to leave. He's abusive, but I just, I'm not ready. I'm not, I don't have the emotional strength. I'm not strong enough. I don't, I don't know that. Okay. So this book's going to help them. I'm calling it 20 lies. The working title is uh, the 20 lies that keep you with your abuser okay. and the fears under those lies. So we're going to get a little deeper and help these ladies figure out the codependent thing and the Christian codependent thing and really get stronger so that they can use the enough as enough book and get out. So it'll okay. be a nice companion. Gotcha. Well, those are those are what's in the hopper. Yeah, I love it. So one of the things that happened is um, my last time I had you, I was, my podcast was called Captain's Corner. I'm no longer a captain, uh, right. but nevertheless, I have this more to story podcast. And one of the things I ask people is, is there more to the story of David E. Clark, PhD? What what is something? Is there something that you like to do that you don't often talk about? Um, like, is there a hobby you have? Tell us a little bit more. More there's more to the story of David Clark. Oh, I like that. I, I am a guy, and people, this may surprise people. I, I'm, I, love, I love to read. I'm a big reader, biographies especially. But my favorite thing is if I, if I there's an entertainment person, a movie star, a TV person that I've always admired, if I can read a biography of that person or an autobiography, I love it. I love the creative process. I read one by Neil Simon, who I think is gone now. Just that brilliant comedy writer and, yeah. and playwright. And it was fascinating. I love all the creative process and the, the writing and the working with other people. I just, it just, it seems superficial. I'm sorry, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's so an escape you, from the intensity. You and the blonde have a Friday night free. Where, what do you do? Oh, man. You read Neil Simon or what do you do? No, no, hopefully not. That wouldn't be right. I'll, I read out loud the Neil Simon book to the blonde. I don't do that. No, we would go out to eat. We love to go out to eat. That's one of our things. And we, we were great conversational. She's funny and she's quirky and she knows me. So we talk about the kids and our life and the future. And she, of course, as you know, she works right with me. So she's got all kinds of input. Uh, so we would go to McAllister's Deli, which we love to go to. Outback Steakhouse is one of our favorites. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Ivoroni Steakhouse is my favorite place in the world. Oh, my goodness. That, we would <laughs> go there. It's woodsy. And uh, not too expensive, and we can talk and spend a couple of hours. That's our thing. Awesome. Well, I love. It. Well, I love love you, do Dr. Clark here, just to close us out. If um, you could say a short prayer for somebody who's listening to this, and they're in that enough is enough situation, like they need to make that move. Could you just pray for them right now? Yeah, good idea. Your Father, we are asking that this podcast yeah. would make a difference in the lives of of ladies and even men who are living with an abusive spouse, Father, with an abusive mm -hmm. person, that they would realize they are. And that step by step, Father, and if they get the book or not, but we hope they do, that they would they would be able to get strong enough in you and build this new life and Father, eventually be able to leave this abusive person. We are trusting you with that outcome, Father. We want the best for these people. Help them to understand this is the way to go to protect themselves, their kids, and even give the abuser himself or herself a chance to change, Father. Would yes. you? Would you answer these prayers for us in Christ's name? Amen. Amen. Dr. Clark, thanks for coming on the More to Story podcast. And thank you all for joining us today. My pleasure. <laughs>